question. And our first talk of the session will be time space trade offs for sponge hashing, attacks, and limitations for short collisions. And the talk will be given by Ashuji Goshal. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Cody Freitag and Ilan Kumar Gotsky. Uh, very broadly, this work is about uh, new pre processing attacks and limitations for finding short collisions in the sponge construction. Hash functions are one of the most fundamental primitives of cryptography that have many different applications. And certain applications like password hashing, et cetera, uh, require a hash function to handle different input lengths. And it is infeasible for us to design a different hash function for every uh, different input length. Uh, therefore, we use iterative hashing as a mechanism to design a variable input length hash function from an underlying uh, fixed input length primitive. And the most uh, commonly used iterative hashing mechanism is the merkel damgard design, uh, where the fixed input length primitive is a compression function that takes as input uh, two n bits and, out, uh, and outputs n bits and hashes a message by breaking it into blocks and repeatedly applying this compression function. Uh, this is used uh, in uh, constructions like MD5, SHA1, and SHA2. After some attacks on uh, MD5 and SHA0 uh, in 2006, NIST started a competition to standardize a new hash function. And after almost a decade, uh, the family of hash functions, Kechak, emerged as the winner. Uh, Kechak is based on a new iterative hashing mechanism, uh, the, which is called the sponge construction, uh, which is a novel alternative uh, to the merkel damgard design. Uh, the one main major point of difference is, for the sponge construction is the fundamental underlying primitive here is a permutation instead of a function. Very briefly, uh, this is how uh, the sponge construction works. Uh, it is parameterized by the bit rate R and the capacity C. And the underlying primitive is a permutation on R plus C bits. The hash of a message M is defined with respect to a hash key or initialization vector IV uh, as follows. Uh, the message is first padded appropriately and then broken up into blocks uh, which are R bits long. Uh, an initial state consisting of R zeros uh, followed by IV is defined. Uh, the first message block is XOR to the state and the permutation evaluated on it to compute the next state. Uh, then the second message block is ex exhort to the, the state and the permutation evaluated again. And this is done till all the message blocks are consumed. Uh, this is known as the absorption phase of the sponge. This is uh, followed by the squeezing phase where the permutation is repeatedly applied uh, to the states and the uh, first R bits extracted out as the hash outputs uh, till there are a sufficient number of bits. For the purpose of this talk, uh, I'll consider a simplified version of sponge uh, where we just have R bits output because we are interested in studying in any uh, studying uh, any uh, compressing sponge hash construction. Uh, one of the fundamental properties that any hash function needs to satisfy is collision resistance, uh, which entails that given a random IV, uh, it must be hard to find two distinct messages uh, that hash to the same uh, output. Uh, pictorially, this is how a collision looks like. The shaded part uh, denotes the colliding hash output. Uh, we are interested in uh, uh, studying the hardness of uh, finding uh, collisions for the sponge construction. And the most common approach to do this is to model the underlying permutation pi as a random one. Uh, when doing so, uh, one can show that the, there is an attack which requires a minimum of uh, 2 power r by 2 and 2 power c by 2 queries uh, to find collisions. Uh, the uh, attack with 2 power r by 2 queries is essentially a birthday style attack where you keep evaluating the permutation with different uh, MIV until two of the evaluations produce outputs uh, which match in the first R bits. Uh, the attack with two parts C by two queries uh, instead finds two evaluations where the outputs match in the last uh, C bits. This can then be turned into a sponge collision by appropriately choosing the second message blocks. Uh, one can show that this attack, word style attack, is indeed optimal in this setting. And the proof is via uh, showing indifferentiability of the sponge construction uh, to a random oracle with R output bits uh, up to uh, 2 power C by 2 queries to the permutation. However, typically uh, in the real world, this permutation pi is a public one, and an adversary might be able to do better by uh, doing a lot of pre processing on the permutation. Uh, and in, in this setting, uh, this birthday style attack is no longer optimal. Uh, in particular, the indifferentiability framework no longer applies. 
uh, the setting of pre-processing adversities has uh, been studied uh, previously in many earlier works, for example, in the context of function inversion, collision resistance, et cetera, and in particular captures the setting of non-uniform attacks, for example, uh, attacks using rainbow tables uh, and so on. Uh, the auxiliary input random permutation model was introduced by uh, Coretti et al. Uh, that captures the power of pre-processing adversaries against random permutation. The uh, uh, collision resistance of sponge is uh, formalized uh, in this model as follows. Uh, an adversary uh, is uh, modeled as a two-phase one. Uh, its pre-processing phase has uh, uh, full access to the permutation, and it can compute any arbitrary S bits of advice, uh, which is passed on to its online phase, uh, which additionally gets as input a uh, randomly sampled IV. Uh, it can make at most uh, a total of T queries to the permutation and its inverse, and it wins if it can output two distinct messages that hash to the same output. Uh, this such an adversary A is referred to as an ST adversary. Uh, we parameterize uh, the advantage in terms of S and T and define it to be the maximum probability of any ST adversary uh, in winning this game. Uh, we note that in allowing the pre-processing phase to compute any arbitrary S bits of pre-processing, uh, we give it a lot of power. Uh, this means that any uh, limitations that we uh, prove in this model are extremely strong guarantees. Uh, Coretti et al. gave a tight characterization of uh, this ST advantage for collision resistance of sponge. Uh, that is, they proved an upper bound of ST square over 2 power C plus T square over 2 power R uh, and uh, gave an attack that achieves uh, this advantage. However, uh, the attack that they gave finds collisions of length roughly equal to T. Uh, and for usual values, these, uh, these are very long collisions uh, of no real uh, practical use. On the other hand, uh, it seems that shorter collisions are somehow harder to find. Uh, therefore, we ask the question, uh, can we uh, characterize the hardness of finding uh, B block collisions for the sponge construction? Uh, this question has been recently studied in a series of work uh, for the case of Merkel Dam Guard. And the key takeaway from those works uh, is that uh, there's a quantitative jump in hardness uh, with the value of B in particular collisions become easier to find as B grows. I refer you to the next talk in the session for more details for the case of merkel Nemgar. In this work, uh, we give new attacks and prove limitations for B block sponge collisions. Very briefly, uh, these are our results. Uh, we give a new attack for finding one block collisions. And this attack in particular uh, uses Hellman's, func uh, Hellman's random function inversion as a subroutine. We give a different attack for uh, other values of B, uh, which is this attack is inspired by rainbow tables. Uh, we prove uh, limitations for values of B equals one and two uh, using two different techniques. Uh, one thing I would like to highlight here is uh, the ability of the adversary to make uh, inverse query to the permutation actually helps us give this new attack for finding one block collisions, but at the same time makes proving limitations uh, significantly harder uh, than uh, for Merkel Dambard. Uh, uh, also, the bounds that we have for uh, the best attacks and the uh, best limitations we can prove uh, do not match, uh, thereby leading to several open problems, uh, which I'll talk more about at the end. Uh, in more detail, uh, we have a new attack for B equals one that has this advantage. Uh, the one here in the subscript uh, uh, denotes uh, the advantage for finding one block collision. Uh, uh, the previously best known attacks for finding one block collision was essentially what we call the trivial attack, uh, where the adversary just uh, remembers uh, collisions for S different IVs in the pre-processing phase. And if the IV it got as input in the online phase was not among those S, S IVs, it just did a birthday style attack. For the case of Merkel Damgaard, this attack, uh, this trivial attack was in fact provably optimal. However, the new attack that we give for sponge uh, is actually better than the trivial attack for certain ranges of parameters. Uh, for example, when C and R are the same, for S equals uh, 2 power 4 C by 5 and T equals 2 power C by 5, uh, our attack has constant advantage while the trivial attack has advantage that is exponentially small in C. Uh, we give a, a, a different attack for other values of B. Uh, this attack is essentially uh, the analog of a, uh, of a similar attack for Merkel-Damgaard for uh, values of B greater than equals two, 
And this is inspired uh, by the rainbow tables attack uh, introduced by Oeschlin. Uh, we proved the following limitation for, uh, for, uh, for the best possible attacks for one block collisions uh, using the uh, bit fixing technique, uh, he, uh, uh, which uh, reduces, uh, which uh, upper bounds the advantage of an ST adversary with the advantage of an adversary that has no preprocessing, uh, but can instead uh, fix uh, at most S times T points of the permutation, uh, making the analysis easier. Uh, we believe that the first term in this bound is not tight and uh, it could possibly be improved. Uh, we uh, finally we proved this limitation for finding two block collisions uh, via the multi instance framework, uh, which was recently introduced by Chung et al. and Akshima et al. Uh, and in, in turn inspired by the techniques for proving constructive churn of bounds by Impaliazzo and Kavanets. Uh, this framework involves reduction to an adversary uh, where uh, the adversary has no preprocessing and has to find collisions uh, with respect to S randomly chosen IDs. Uh, uh, one interesting, uh, very interesting thing about this result is that it shows us it is strictly harder to find two block collisions than uh, T block ones, thus uh, giving us a separation similar to what we already know for Merkel dam guard. Further, uh, this uh, shows us that our attack uh, for B equals two is actually optimal when ST cube is less than two par C. Uh, and uh, we believe that the last term in, in our bound is not tight and uh, there's room for improvement. So uh, summarizing uh, after our work, this is what the state of affairs looks like for sponge. And the only thing I'd like to highlight here is that for all values of B, there are gaps for the best attack we know and the best limitation that we can prove. Uh, I refer you to our paper for more details about our two limitation results and the attack for B greater than equals two. And for the rest of the talk, uh, I'll be uh, covering our new attack for finding one block collisions. So we give an attack that has this following advantage. Um, looking a bit ahead, uh, I'll define this quantity uh, epsilon h uh, to be the square root of the quantity inside the omega. Uh, this is essentially the advantage uh, uh, achieved by Hellman's attack for uh, inverting uh, random functions. The reason that this appears in our bound is because we will be using Hellman's attack uh, as a subroutine. So when an adversary has to find a one block collision uh, uh, for a sponge, what it really has to do is it has to find uh, two distinct messages, uh, M and M prime, such that the evaluation of the permutation uh, on M IV and M prime IV produce the same first R bits of the output. Uh, here, uh, I'll use the index one and two to denote the first R bits and the last C bits of a sponge state respectively. Uh, as a first step to constructing an adversary, uh, what we'll do is we'll try, we'll switch to uh, trying to uh, switch to uh, make the adversary solving a much harder problem uh, where not only do we want an adversary uh, to find two messages M and M prime, such that the evaluation of pi on M IV and M prime IV have the same first R bits of the output, we want those R bits of the output to be all zeros. The reason for making the switch to a harder problem will become clear very soon. To that end, uh, let's take an alternate view of the problem. Let's define a function f, uh, which has c bits input and c bits output, uh, as the last c bit of the evaluation uh, of pi inverse uh, on r zeros followed by the input. Uh, the main thing I would like to uh, highlight about this function f is it is independent on, of iv. Uh, we actually switched to solving a harder problem because we wanted the function to have this property. And this property would in turn allow us to use existing pre-processing attacks for function inversion. Let's see how. So we propose the following attack strategy. Given an I, a random IV as input, we invert the function f uh, on uh, IV to find two distinct pre-images, x and x prime. And then we compute the message M as the evaluation as the first R bits of the output of evaluation of pi inverse on R zeros followed by X and similarly compute M prime and output these two messages. Okay, why does this even make any sense? Uh, uh, observe that if indeed X was an inverse of IV under F, uh, we have that the last 
R bits of the evaluation of pi inverse on R zeros followed by X is IB. And we already know from its definition that the first uh, R bits of the evaluation is M. Uh, this means that uh, the, uh, the uh, first R, uh, R bits of the evaluation of pi uh, on M and IV are all zeros. And we can prove uh, the sa same fact for M prime. So now given that we, we can invert uh, F on IV and find two distinct pre-images, we have an attack. But how do we do this? So function inversion is a, has been uh, in the pre-processing setting has been uh, a well-studied problem. Uh, it was first studied by Hellman and later by Fiat and R. The specific setting that we are interested in is when the function f is a random one. Uh, there's an adversary, which is a two-phase one. It's a pre-processing phase. It gets a, the function as input. It can compute any arbitrary S bits of advice on it, uh, and uh, which it passes on to the online phase, uh, which gets uh, additionally a randomly sampled value y from the image of the function can make at most uh, t queries to the function and uh, it, it wins if it can output some x such that f of x equals y. Hellman gave an attack, uh, uh, gave an explicit adversary that has the following advantage, uh, epsilon h, which I defined earlier. Uh, now the question is, are we done? Can we just plug this in? Uh, turns out there are several technical challenges that we need to overcome. Uh, First off, this function f is not a random function, uh, while Hellman's attack works for random functions. Uh, secondly, uh, the uh, challenge that the random IV uh, may not even be in the image of the function. Finally, uh, Hellman's attack uh, guarantees us uh, only one pre-image, while we need to find two distinct pre-images. I'll speak very briefly uh, how we handle all the three challenges. So for the first challenge, uh, uh, first we note that there is a more general al algorithm for function inversion that works for general functions by fiat and R, but using that does not really suffice for us because the attack we end up getting finally uh, has advantage worse uh, than the trivial attack. What we end up doing is observing that F is close enough to a random function uh, for, for us to adapt the Hellman's analysis. Uh, onto the second challenge that the random IV uh, might not uh, be in the image of F. So an initial observation is a constant fraction of the codomain has at least two pre-images. Uh, but note that this does not suffice uh, because a Hellman's attack might fail for this constant fraction of the codomain. So what we do is we analyze Hellman's attack and prove a very strong statement showing that uh, uh, for any fixed value in the codomain, the Hel Hellman's attack succeeds with probability that is proportional to the number of pre-images that value has. And uh, this turns out to be enough for, for our case. Finally, uh, we need to find two distinct pre-images while Hellman's attack only guarantees us one. Uh, the first thought could be to just run uh, the online phase twice uh, with different randomness and hope that it gives us two distinct pre-images, but it's not immediately clear that it works. So we further analyze Hellman's attack and show that, in fact, for a value y, it finds a, a, a pre-image uniformly in F inverse of y. And this, this in, in turn shows that it's enough to actually run the attack twice with different randomness. And, in, and that's one of the reasons we end up getting an epsilon h square uh, type of bound. Uh, there are, of course, many technical subtleties which, for which I refer you uh, to the paper for details. Uh, so there are two main takeaway messages from this work. First, uh, the ability of an adversary to make inverse queries uh, in the sponge construction are actually very useful uh, to give new attacks. In fact, the, this ability allows us to give an attack for sponge, an analog for which does not exist for Merkel Damgaard. Secondly, uh, just like Merkel Damgaard, even for sponge, finding short collisions like two block collisions are probably harder to find than arbitrary length ones. Uh, there are several open problems. Of course, uh, one is tight, proving tight bounds for values of B equals one and two. Uh, second, our attack for uh, values of B greater than equals two uh, do not leverage the inverse query in any way and coming up with new attacks that do would be an interesting open, uh, interesting question for uh, uh, investigation. Uh, 
finally, uh, proving uh, new uh, limitations for values of B greater than equals three uh, would also be a possible direction of future research. Uh, the full version of our paper is on ePrint. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We have time for one question. If there are any questions. All right, let's thank our speaker again. I'll, hold on, I'll introduce you. <laughs> uh, our next talk is going to be on time space trade offs for bounded length collisions in Merkle dam guard hashing, uh, which is a soft merge with time space lower bounds for finding collisions in Merkle dam guard hash functions. And Akshima will give the talk. Hello, everyone. Um, today I will be talking about our work uh, about finding collisions in MD-based hash functions uh, with pre-computation. Uh, this is a joint work with Xiao Go and Jipeng Liu. Um, so uh, Ashrajit was kind enough to introduce what is Merkel Damgard, but I would just go about it again. So uh, Merkel Damgard is one of the most popular constructions for uh, hash functions. It is so popular that it motivated us and a lot of other prior works to study this particular construction. Uh, a lot of hash algorithms like MD5, SHA1, SHA2, they all, their designs are based on this uh, construction. So uh, how does this construction work? This construction uses a one-way compression function to hash messages of arbitrary length. And how they do that is uh, they break the message into blocks of fixed size. Uh, for the rest of this talk, I will always denote a compression function by H, and they would always be in the, uh, 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 like it would always be from the uh, domain uh, of size N times M to a uh, range of size N. So in this diagram, this uh, the message is X, and it's broken into B blocks, X1 through XP. And then the compression function is iteratively applied on uh, these blocks to obtain uh, the output of MDH. Uh, assuming that H is a random function, it is known that uh, any adversary that makes T queries has an advantage of up to T square over N. But this is uh, when we think that, uh, when this is when we, uh, when the adversary has no information about H beforehand. Uh, it, it is, perfectly possible and practical for the adversary to pre-compute some information about H and use that later to find better attacks. Um, in fact, rainbow tables is a very good example of uh, pre-computing adversaries and their power to launch better attacks uh, for function inversion. And now we wanted to study the power of pre-computing adversaries for finding for collision finding in merkle damgard based hash functions. So um, this is our problem statement. And I would like to establish some uh, parameters in our model. So we would be talking about uh, adversaries uh, that get S bits of advice, pre-computed advice. They make at most T queries to H and they're required to find collisions that are at most B blocks long. Uh, so a lot of uh, prior works have studied this problem of collision finding with uh, pre-computation, particularly for uh, merkle damgard based hash functions. And this is this table lists all the results of those prior works. Um, Coretti et al.'s work from 2018 were the first who studied this problem. And they showed indeed it is true 
that uh, pre-computing adversaries can launch better attacks. They can find, uh, it is easier for them to find collisions uh, with pre-computation. Uh, so they gave an attack, they presented an attack that achieved an advantage of ST square over N. Uh, they were also able to prove that uh, that was, that those are like, that is the optimal attack, but there is a caveat in their attack. Uh, and I would like to talk about that caveat with an example. Consider SHA2, uh, which is an MD-based hash function, uh, where N is equal to 2 to the 256, and M is a 512-bit space. Uh, for any ad adversary that, uh, uh, store, that has an advice of 2 to the 70 bits, uh, their ST square over N bound implies that the adversary needs to make about 2 to the 93 queries in order to achieve constant advantage. So, however, the, uh, the attack that uh, the Kureti et al. presented, their attack finds collisions that are also like two to the 93 blocks long. And two to the 93 blocks is like yota bytes of data. Uh, think about the applications where uh, hash functions are used like digital signatures and um, like hashing passwords. Like any adversary that finds, that's finding yota bytes of data is like, it's meaningless. That's not uh, any meaningful attack. So uh, in one of my previous works with David, Andy, and Hotek, we wanted to study what happens if an adversary is, uh, has to find like uh, B bounded length collisions. So for B equals to two to the 20, the best attack that we could find required two to the 166 queries instead of two to the 193 queries, uh, two to the 93 queries. So our best attack, like uh, it would achieve the advantage of STB over N instead of ST square over N. And this made us wonder if uh, the ST square over N bound uh, was, uh, was pessimistic in, in a practical setting where we are looking at bounded length collisions. Uh, so we conjectured that, uh, so we gave this attack of uh, that achieved STB over N as I uh, told you before. Uh, and we conjectured that it was the optimal attack. However, we could not prove that for all the pre-computing adversaries. We could show that only for a restricted class of adversaries, and that is what this red aesthetic denotes. Uh, what made us believe in our conjecture was the fact that we could prove it for two block collision finding, uh, that the advantage is ST over N. And it is indeed the case that finding uh, short collisions is harder than finding uh, collisions where there's no restriction on the length. Uh, the follow-up work of Gushal et al., which has been ex accepted at this paper, it's a, at this conference itself and a soft mo merge with our work, they managed to show that uh, the STB conjecture of ACDW is indeed true for constant B. And uh, how they did that more precisely was they gave, a, they gave a bound that has a factor of log square S exponentially large in uh, B. So exponentially large in B. And uh, so this reduces to a polylog factor when B is a constant. However, this bound uh, very quickly becomes meaningless uh, as B grows larger. They presented another bound uh, which holds for any pre-computing adversary and any B. And that bound is S to the 4 T B square over N. Uh, however, observe that when S Q B square would be greater than T, in that case, this bound is worse than the S T square over N bound of Kureti et al. So this does not say anything uh, about this parameter range, like whether finding collisions is harder like, or not. So this is what motivated us to study this problem further. And uh, also like the attack, like the proofs that were given by the ACDW paper and GK paper, uh, they were very complicated. So uh, another objective for us was to simplify these proofs. And we managed to do both of the, both the things. Um, and this, so we managed to prove a bound of STB over N times max of one and ST square over N um, for any B and any pre-computing adversary. Uh, let us look at our bound more, like this very unreadable bound more carefully. So what does this bound mean? It means when ST square over N is less than equal to one, our bound would be STB over N. 
And for, so we managed to prove the STB conjecture for this parameter range. When ST square over N is greater than one, in that case, our bound would be STB over N times ST square over N. And even though this does not uh, prove the STB conjecture, it is worth noting that this bound would always be less than ST square over N, and which confirms that finding bounded length collision is definitely harder than finding collisions where there's no restriction on the length. Uh, so before I talk about our techniques, I would like to precisely uh, define the model. Uh, Ashujit did that in his talk, but I would just like to trade because I have made the slide. So, uh, so uh, in the pre-computation model, the adversary works in two stages. In the first stage, adversary gets, gets computationally unbounded access to the compression function H, but it has to output a bounded length advice, uh, which would be S bits. Then uh, in the second stage, the adversary gets the challenge sort. Uh, it takes the advice. It gets to make T queries uh, to H, and it is required to output uh, messages that collide under MDH with the challenge sort. And there is an additional restriction that these messages have to be at most blocks long. Um, so, uh, I would just like to point out that why analyzing this model is so hard. So observe that uh, these Q1 through Q2 QT queries, the responses to these queries can no longer be thought of as IIDs because the adversary gets S bit information on H. So that's why like Coretti et al, they reduce the problem to uh, finding, uh, like bounding the security in another model, namely the pre-sampling model. Uh, so the pre-sampling model is, uh, it works like, again, an adversary in this uh, model works in two stages. In the first stage, the adversary gets to fix uh, and uh, fix, uh, the function H at P points, then in the online phase, it uh, it does not get any advice. It just gets uh, the challenge solved. It gets to make T queries uh, to this function H and it has to output collisions. Uh, so this where this H uh, is, is the function with the hard coded points. So what, when I say hard coded points, what that means is whatever was prefixed in the stage one, for those points, the adversary has to output the fixed uh, point, like the fixed uh, response. And for the other, it can like uh, respond with IIDs. So uh, Kureti et al showed that uh, for any, uh, the, if the advantage of any adversary in the pre-sampling model, where the adversary fixes ST points and makes T queries uh, is bounded by Delta, then the advantage of any collision finding adversary in the pre-computation model where the adversary uh, make, gets S-bit advice and makes T queries is of the order delta. So apart from giving this reduction, uh, they showed like the advantage of for collision finding in the pre-sampling model is of the order ST square over N, which uh, implies their bound in the pre-computation model. The ACDW paper showed, however, uh, we cannot hope to get any better bounds in the pre-sampling model for bounded length collision. Uh, and that's how they showed that by uh, uh, giving an attack for two block collision finding in the pre-sampling model that achieved an advantage of ST square over N. So they reduced the problem to another model, like solving in another model, which is namely the multi-instance game. Uh, now, what is multi-instance game? As the name suggests, uh, it's just the adversary gets uh, multiple instances of a problem and it has to solve each one of them in order to win. So for our particular case, uh, the adversary gets uh, S solves one at a time and it gets to make T queries and it has to find collisions on each of these instances in order to win. Uh, note that here again, the adversary does not get an advice and it just has to solve all these S instances. Uh, so ACTW paper showed that if the advantage of any uh, collision finding adversary in the multi-instance game can be bounded by delta to the S, where uh, the adversary is making T queries for each instance and it gets S instances, then the advantage for any adversary in the pre-computation model 
can be bounded by two times delta. Again, the adversary here is get, getting an advice of his bits and making T queries. Uh, so they also uh, the ACTW paper bounded uh, their uh, uh, bounded the advantage of this multi instance game to st plus t square over n to the power s for two block collision finding, which implied their bound in the pre computation model. Um, the GK paper uh, they used a similar approach as the ACTW paper, but because they were looking at like constant uh, block collisions. Uh, they had to. They had a lot more types of collisions that they needed to handle. So it was difficult for them. Like it was a more challenging task to bound the advantage in multi-instance game, uh, which they managed to do. So uh, for more details, please refer to their talk on uh, YouTube, and um, they their paper is also up on ePrint. Uh, finally, I want to talk about our techniques. So we also reduced to the multi-instance game, uh, but we the way we viewed the multi-instance game model is slightly different and how we analyzed it allowed us to get better bounds. So uh, let's fix an adversary and uh, let XI be the indicator uh, variable that adversary wins on salt AI. What ACTW paper and GK paper did was they looked at the probability that the adversary wins on all the solves simultaneously. So what? So if this like this box, this uh, uh, this depicts uh, S solves and T uh, queries and responses that are made for each of these solves. So what they tried to do was if an adversary has to win on all these S solves, it has to find collisions on all these S solves, which means there should be S collisions in these ST queries. And uh, then these collisions can be compressed uh, using this adversary. However, uh, it should not be possible to compress H because H is a random function. Uh, so uh, that's how they were able to bound this probability that all XIs are, are one. Uh, it is worth noting that uh, in this, like when they are like looking at all like this, when they're like bounding this simultaneously, uh, there are a lot of different types of collisions that can happen. And in order to like compress each of the cases, uh, sometimes like this, this compression algorithms can become like very crazy and like unintuitive of what exactly is happening in the single instance. So how we viewed this model is slightly different. We, uh, we instead of bounding the term like this on the left, the term on the left, we bounded the probability that uh, the adversary wins in the ith instance, given that it wins on all the previous i minus one instances. So uh, if the adversary, so in the previous i minus one instances, the adversary would have made a total of i minus one times t queries, which is always like less than equal to st queries. So we think of those as offline queries, then the adversary gets the ith challenge solved AI, and then it gets to make t queries, which we refer to as the online queries. So uh, this sort of looks like still, still like a single instance problem. And um, this, uh, and now, now we need to bound this probability of x i given x less than i to a term to a uh, to a bound that is exactly the same as what we need in the pre-computation model. So this becomes a little more intuitive. So in order to explain our techniques in a little more detail, I would just focus on one particular type of collision, and this is this collision um, here. This curved uh, arrows depict uh, they uh, are denote they denote queries Q2 and Q3, and the straight arrow one is Q1. And for this type of collision, like this collision depicts uh, the colliding messages would be like M1 concatenated with M2 and M1 concatenated with M3. And we are looking at the collision type where Q2, Q3 happen in the offline they happen among the offline queries, and Q1 happens among the online queries. The idea to note here is the output of Q1 is limited to certain values. What are those values? Um, they have to be the input sort of one of the ST queries in the offline, among the offline queries. Which means the probability that there exists a Q1-like online query is 
at most st square over n. But we can do better than that because there is more structure to what these q2, q3 queries can be. So these q2, q, uh, so this q2 query, like the query uh, whose input sol has to be the output of q1, has to be a query uh, that shares the input salt with another query that has the same output. So basically, we should be looking at how many Q2, Q3 type pairs can exist among the offline queries. Uh, so that's what we want to look at, how many pairs can there be? And we call this as useful knowledge gain that we get, get from the offline queries. So in the worst case, in the worst case, there can be ST over two such Q2, Q3 type pairs. Uh, because if we assume that every query in the offline uh, phase shares this kind of structure with another query, then in that case, there would be ST over two such pairs. Uh, and this implies a bound of ST square over N. But it's worth noting that the, pro that the chance that we can get like ST over two such pairs in the offline query is very unlikely. It's like, it, it, it has a very small chance and this, what this st over two pair like this bound is sort of a worst case analysis and this is very similar to what was happening in pre-sampling because pre-sampling was allowing the adversaries to fix these st points so and we believe that uh, we should be able to bound better via uh, an average case analysis which is which is what we did so, and we showed that the probability of finding more than S pairs, uh, Q2, Q3 like pairs is in ST queries is very, very small. So, which implies uh, with a good probability, there are only S such pairs among the offline queries and which allows us to bound uh, that the probability of uh, there existing a Q1 like online query to be ST over N. Um, now there are a lot of different types of collisions that can happen for B equals to two and like general B. So uh, this is just a brief overview of how our work proof works. We identified all types of useful knowledge gains from the offline queries. For each type, we showed the, that the probability of high knowledge gain is very small, even conditioned on winning in all the previous rounds. And when a none of the knowledge gain is high, we can easily bound uh, this probability of xi given x less than i as required. So um, for future work, one of the most important things that we would like to know is whether for st square greater than or equal to n, if there is a better attack or if there is a better security bound, that is definitely one of the most important future works that we look forward to doing. And thank you. Uh, our paper is in um, our paper is on eprint. Please give it a read and thank you for your attention. Do we have any questions? All right, let's thank our speaker again. All right, our next talk is going to be sustained space and cumulative complexity trade offs for data dependent memory hard functions. And Blake Coleman will give the talk. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. And this work was with my advisor, Jeremiah Blocky. So, uh, specialized hardware such as ASICs can evaluate hash functions orders of magnitude times faster than standard hardware. This is a problem because it offers an advantage for offline attackers who brute force passwords. 
memory hard functions aim to minimize this hardware advantage. And as a result, they protect low entropy secrets like passwords from brute force attacks. So first we acknowledge that uh, memory cost is relatively uniform across these different types of hardware. And so what we want is a function whose computational costs are dominated by memory costs. In particular, we wanna force an attacker to lock up large amounts of memory for the duration of the computation. This will make it expensive even on customized hardware. But now the question is, how can we prove that we've done this? Uh, how do we quantify memory hardness? Well, a standard way to characterize the space cost of a function is via space-time complexity. The space-time cost of an evaluation algorithm is just the maximum space used times the duration of the computation, and the space-time complexity of a, fun of a function is just the uh, space-time cost of the cheapest evaluation algorithm. This is great because it, there's a rich time-space trade, uh, rich theory of time-space trade-offs, uh, but unfortunately, it's not appropriate for password hashing or many other use cases for memory hard functions. The reason is that it doesn't amortize well. So what you can do is if you have a function that might have high system high space-time complexity, but you only have to sustain the maximal space for a short amount of time, you can essentially stagger their start times in parallel and ev evaluate the function many times with a space-time cost that's very similar to if you evaluated it once. At a high level, uh, we really want it to be true that making 10 password guesses in parallel um, is 10 times as costly as making a single password guess. So how we can get around this is by using cumulative complexity. And this just measures the sum of the space used um, across the duration of the computation. And um, at first glance, this looks very promising because uh, it, it turns out that the cumulative complexity of evaluating a function m times in parallel um, is m times uh, the cost of evaluating it once. So now we can look at an example. Sscript is a widely used memory hard function, and it was proven to have maximal cumulative com complexity of n squared, where n is our running time parameter. So now the question is, um, does this maximal CC actually align with our intuitions for memory hardness? And the answer is not quite, because we can evaluate Sscript using constant memory for n squared time. And remember what we wanted out of a memory hard function, we wanted to force an attacker to lock up large amounts of memory for the duration of the computation. So how we can fix this is by using a um, cost metric that is uh, very tightly correlated to what we want. So now we can use sustained space complexity, which measures the time spent above a certain memory threshold. And um, you can see that this is stricter than cumulative complexity because um, if, you're, if you sustain S space for T time, then your cumulative cost is going to be at least S times T. So now that we have this um, way of measuring cost that's very, uh, you know, it aligns with our intuitions for memory hard functions, we want to know how good can we do. Uh, ideally, we want to construct memory hard functions in which any evaluation strategy sustains n space for n steps. Unfortunately, um, this is impossible because any memory hard function can be evaluated uh, using only n over log n space, although these evaluation strategies can have exponential runtime. So now, um, since we can't do that, we wonder if we can relax um, our goal slightly and still have say something strong about uh, guarantees. So we wanna know whether or not we can force any attacker that has low sustained space complexity to pay a huge penalty in uh, cumulative cost. And so in this work, um, our goal is to construct a memory hard function in which any strategy either sustains n space for n steps or has cumulative cost much greater than n squared. So we examine the sustained space and cumulative complexity trade-offs for two practical memory hard functions. And then we give a theoretical construction that actually achieves, the, uh, achieves near optimal trade-offs. 
we've already seen that for S script, we can evaluate it using constant space and n squared cumulative complexity. So the first function we consider is DR sample. It's a practical side channel resistant memory hard function. Uh, and we give some slight modifications and show that any strategy either sustains n over log n space for n steps or has cumulative cost n cubed over log n. Next, we take a look at Argon2. Uh, Argon2 is widely deployed. It won the password hashing competition in uh, 2015, um, and it's in many cryptographic libraries. We show that any strategy either sustains um, n to the 1 minus epsilon space for n steps, or it has cumulative costs slightly more than n squared. Finally, we give a theoretical construction, which actually achieves um, the maximal sustained space, com uh, sustained space parameter that we were hoping for. So any strategy either sustains n space for n steps, or it has cumulative cost n to the 3 minus epsilon. So now I want to talk about um, how we did these general proof strategies, and then I'm going to talk about uh, our construction. So first, um, a memory herd function is defined with respect to a random graph family, and these encode data dependencies. The input to our function, uh, maybe it's like a password and a salt. Um, and so from here, we compute the labels for the nodes. The label for node zero is just the hash of the input. And the label for any other node is just the hash of the labels of its predecessors. The output of our function is just going to be uh, the last label in our graph. So some nodes have what's, um, what's called dynamic edges. And this is how the you know, random graphs play a role. And these edges depend on the labels of uh, a node's predecessor. For example, node three has a dynamic edge, which we denote R3. Um, and that's going to uh, use the randomness from when we take the hash of the labels uh, for, of labels zero and one. Uh, so it could either land on zero or one uh, according to some probability distribution. And the important takeaway here is that uh, this edge, uh, which node it lands on, depends on these previous labels. And those previous labels uh, in turn depend on the input of our function. So then these edges depend uh, directly on uh, the input. And that's why we call graphs with these dynamic edges data dependent memory hard functions. If they don't have any dynamic edges, then we call them data independent memory hard functions. Great. Um, so now, how do, why do we even care about data-dependent memory hard functions? Well, remember, our goal was to um, construct a memory hard function in which any strategy either sustains n space for n steps, or it has cumulative costs much more than n squared. It turns out that any uh, data-independent memory hard function can be computed uh, using cumulative cost uh, strictly less than n squared. And this actually makes these trade-offs impossible. So ideally, we want to use these dynamic edges to get stronger guarantees. So to prove these results, we prove them um, using dynamic pebbling games. So here, we're going to be placing pebbles on nodes in the graph. And you can essentially think of a node as a label. So placing a, uh, a pebble on a node is like computing a label. And keeping a pebble on a node is like storing a label in memory. So um, you know the rule is you can always place a pebble on a node whose parents all have pebbles on them. And again, these dynamic edges can appear when you pebble all of the static predecessors to a node. Um, and these uh, edges appear land on nodes according to some uh, predetermined probability distribution. Again, our goal is to place a pebble on the last node in our graph, the sink. So now I'll give a quick pebbling example. We're going to pebble this graph. You can always place a pebble on node 1. Now we can place one on node 2. Since we have pebbles on nodes 1 and 2, we can pebble node 3. This causes a dynamic edge to appear, which just happened to land on node 2. So we'll pebble node 2, 4, and 5. OK, so now we're ready to talk about um, our proof structure. Um, and just as a reminder, our goal is to construct memory herd functions such that any strategy either sustains n space for n steps or has cumulative cost much more than n squared. 
So in general, um, our setup is the following. We have a graph where like the first half is highly connected according to some metric and it has high cumulative complexity. The second half of our graph um, has dynamic edges coming from the first half. The idea is that if a strategy only has a few pebbles on the graph, then there's a good chance they're going to have to repebble um, a lot of that first half of the graph and they're going to incur very high cumulative costs. So in our construction, the graph that serves um, to have these, uh, that to achieve these connectivity goals um, are what is called ST robust graphs. So ST robust graphs have N inputs and outputs with the property that you can remove any K nodes from the graph. And there's still a subgraph with N minus K inputs, N minus K outputs uh, with a path from all of the inputs to all of the outputs. Our second ingredient is depth robustness. A graph is ED depth robust. If you can remove any E nodes from the graph and there's still a path of length D. Um, this is useful because if a graph is ED depth robust, then it, then it has cumulative cost much um, at least E times D. As an example, this graph is one four depth robust and you can see this because you can just remove any of the nodes and there's still a path of length four. So what we do is we combine our first ingredients, which were, were ST robust graphs and with our second ingredient depth robustness. Uh, so what we do is we overlay a graph that's n by n to the one minus epsilon depth robust onto the inputs of our ST robust graphs. So now repebbling these inputs is going to cost, uh, have cumulative cost n to the two minus epsilon. So now the question is, how can we make a low sustained space attacker repebble these uh, inputs many times? What we do is we add a line graph to the end of our construction, and then we have dynamic edges coming um, to each of the nodes in the line graph from, the ran from random outputs of our ST robust graph. So now um, if an attacker wants to place a pebble on some node in our line graph, but they only have relatively few pebbles on the graph, then there's a good chance they're not going to have a pebble on the random output they need. Um, and with constant probability, there's going to be paths from many of the inputs to that particular output, meaning they'll have to repebble these inputs and that's going to cost um, cumulative cost into two minus epsilon. So we can show that if an attacker is frequently low memory, then they're going to have to um, repebble the inputs a linear number of times with respect to our runtime parameter with high probability. And so um, putting this all together, you get that uh, for such attackers, their cumulative cost will be n to the three minus epsilon. On the other hand, if an attacker is trying to pebble a known neural line graph, but they do have a lot of pebbles on the graph, we can just count that towards our sustained space complexity. So putting this all together, we get that um, any strategy for evaluating our memory heart function either sustains n pebbles for n steps or that it has cumulative cost n to the three minus epsilon. So in this work, we showed that there are some current and practical memory hard functions which have high sustained space and cumulative complexity trade-offs. We also gave a theoretical construction with near optimal trade-offs. This also generated some open problems. First, like you know, our proofs were done in this dynamic pebbling model with these pebbling games. We wanna know whether we, these claims can be proven in the random oracle model. For memory hard functions that don't have dynamic edges, uh, there's actually a general reduction that relates any evaluation algorithm with a, a equivalent cost pebbling strategy. So we wonder um, if you can give a reduction, um, a similar reduction for memory hard functions that do have dynamic edges. Finally, um, our theoretical construction is very costly to implement. Um, and so we wonder if there's a practical memory hard function that still achieves the maximal sustained space parameter. Um, so is there a practical memory hard function in which any strategy um, must sustain 
n space for n steps or have cumulative costs much more than n squared. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. We have time for some questions. Um, so if I understood correctly, you mentioned that you proved your result uh, in a very nice uh, and intuitive pebbling model, but when you try to actually prove it in the random oracle using compression or something, uh, the proof gets stuck, unlike previous results where I think you do have this proof. Can you like maybe point what the difficulty is? So when you try, is it like hopeless? Yeah, um, so um, I think people have, you know, we've worked a little bit on trying to do such a reduction. Um, it, essentially, it, it just, uh, I don't know, it's just uh, kind of difficult with the randomness, right? So, you know, that's why for S-Script, for example, um, they, they opted to instead do a direct proof. Uh, that's their paper where they proved that it's maximally memory hard. Right. Um, so yeah, it's still, you know, a difficult open problem. Uh, but it's not like yeah. a obvious barrier that some who, you know, you just try and some who inherently just, there is no hope of it. Oh, no, it's no, no, no. It's yeah. not like... So, so I, I believe there is hope for uh, contracting such a reduction. Uh, we just haven't uh, figured it out yet. So. And also just in terms of optimal parameters. So when you say much greater than n squared, at some point you said exponential. Uh, so what is optimal? Is n, n, n cube optimal? So n cube is really obviously mm -hmm. optimal? What is so, so what I meant was um, by exponential is that uh, is the result that any memory hard function can be evaluated using n over log n space. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is that, that the runtime can be exponential right. for those. Um, n cubed is the best you can do uh, just by some uh, previous work and uh, space time trade offs. Um, yeah. The best you can hope for is like a penalty of n squared, but we haven't yes. achieved that yet. So n, n, n cubed would be the optimal, which you have in almost every year. Yes. So maybe to add to Evgeny's question, yeah. so it's always complicated when, you know, either there is randomness the edges are dynamic or there's a pre-computation that you don't know and in fact there are two counter examples where the, you can show that the, the tapping strategy does not imply a bound for the random oracle model i forgot exactly the thing but basically you can xor notes and that actually helps in some settings so in some cases it's simply wrong and you don't know what oh. to do there so um i forgot the link it's in some paper in some appendix there is this concrete counter example of the graph where it's not true oh okay uh, i wasn't aware of that i do the link yeah. For you, um, you mentioned many different complexity definitions in the beginning of your talk. Are there ones that you tried along the way that you didn't mention here? Um, no, we didn't uh, quite try um, space-time complexity, but uh, I, I thought it kind of helped understand how we got to using sustained space and why we had to uh, also use cumulative complexity. Yeah. All right, let's thank our speaker again. All right, our final talk of this session is going to be a video. So I will ask Kevin to share a screen and then wait for us to confirm that we can see it, please. Thank you. All right, we're ready to go. Hi, I'm Shaha, and this is joint work with Moni Nao. In this work, we study communication complexity in computational settings. First, let's recall communication complexity. The input is split between Alice and Bob, but they can communicate in order to compute some target function. In communication complexity, we are interested in protocol with as little communication as possible. You can think of a simple target function as the equality predicate. Alice and Bob have to figure out whether their inputs are equal or not. Most of the results apply to almost any reasonable predicate, where there is no input identical to another. Also, in our computational settings, we will also require predicates to have an efficient description in some sense. Two known network layouts in communication complexity are the interactive model, where participants can communicate without any round limit, 
and the simultaneous messages model where participants can send only a single message to a third party, as we'll see next. The randomness is also an important property of the model, whether there exists shared public randomness or not. We're not considering here the deterministic protocols. The communication complexity of the equality predicate is well studied and known to be in the interactive model constant in the presence of public randomness and log n otherwise. Let's move on now to the simultaneous messages model. In this model, Alice and Bob get their inputs and produce one message each. These messages are sent to a third party, a referee, and the referee has to compute the target function with some constant high probability. For example, assume that Alice and Bob have to check if their inputs are equal and have no common randomness. They can use a good error correcting code, arrange the code words in a square, and now Alice's message will be a random row, and Bob's message will be a random column. The referee just compares the matched symbols. By the error correcting code, the error is bounded by a constant, and hence this protocol can be amplified easily by parallel repetitions. Observe that the size of a row or a column is square root of n, and hence this is the communication complexity of the protocol. This protocol matches the known lower bound for the equality predicate in the simultaneous messages model with no common randomness. This lower bound was proved several times. The proof of Baba and Kimmel is general and holds for any non-redundant predicate. As a side note, you can see that their result is also a trade-off between Alice and Bob messages size, and the previous protocol can be tweaked to match it. In our work, the central question is, can the communication complexity be reduced in a computational world? One motivation is to discuss settings closer to the real world. We study how communication complexity models can be fitted to be computational. Hence, we redefine the public randomness, consider stateful participant and a computational adversary instead of worst case input. We discuss two computational variations. The preset randomness model, where there is a common random string, but the inputs are chosen by an adversary who also sees that common randomness. The second model is the free talk model that we'll discuss later. Now, we move on to define the preset randomness model. First, we have Alice, Bob and the adversary. No inputs yet. Now, the public random is sampled and visible for everyone. Then, the inputs are chosen by the adversary. Then, the participants can sample fresh private randomness and have to compute one message each. The referee gets the messages and outputs a decision. Notice that, assuming collision resistant hash functions, the communication complexity of the equality predicate in the preset randomness model can be reduced significantly by simply running the information theoretic protocol on the digest. That is, the square root of n lower bound in the simultaneous messages model and log n in the interactive model can be outperformed assuming SCRH. Our results go in the other direction. We show that breaking those known lower bounds in the preset randomness model implies the existence of DCRH, distributional collision resistant hash function. DCRH is where only random collisions are guaranteed to be hard to find. That is, we show an explicit construction of a CRH function from such a protocol. We also show that there are no protocols of constant communication in the preset randomness model regardless of assumptions. We used techniques from Baba and Kimmel's proof to show those results. The main idea behind the proofs in the preset randomness model is the characterizing multiset. The idea is that for any input, Alice's behavior can be approximated by a multiset. That is, there exists a multiset with the following property. When we run the protocol, we can use a uniform sample from this multiset 
instead of running Alice and still get with high probability the same output as running Alice in the protocol. Hence, for every input x, Alice can be replaced by a multiset. We show that such a multiset can be sampled with high probability by running Alice multiple times on that input x independently. We construct a function by sampling a public random string and t random tapes of Alice. The input of the function is an input x for Alice, and the output of the function is the t messages Alice produces for this input x and these t random tapes and public random. Now we'll sketch the proof that this function is a DC arrange. First, the function is indeed compressing. Now, the main observation is that a collision in the function is two inputs that share a characterizing multiset. That means two inputs that make Alice behave similar. However, since our predicate is non-redundant, there exists why such that f of x y is not equal to f of x prime y, but since Alice's behavior is similar, the output of the protocol will be incorrect at least on one of the pairs. We got that a collision finder for that function can be used to find bad inputs for that protocol. However, we claim only for DCRH and not CRH, since the characterization property of the function is only with high probability. And that means that there exists input x such that age of x doesn't characterize x. And hence, there exist bad collisions, collisions that won't necessarily induce bad inputs for the protocol. The second model is the stateful free talk model. In this model, Alice and Bob can communicate freely before the inputs are chosen. Then, the inputs are chosen by an adversary, and now, the communication is measured. In this variation, we study the simultaneous messages model. We consider an adversary with two additional advantages. The first, he is rushing and can choose the input for Bob at the last moment after seeing Alice's message. And the second, he doesn't have to attack a specific session. He can wait for an opportunity to attack. We showed in this model that very efficient protocols imply the existence of secret key agreement. Note that, assuming secret key agreement, optimal protocols exist, as we'll see next. First, let's recall secret key agreement. Secret key agreement is where two parties with nothing in common agree on a secret key. The key has to be known only to the participants and not to any listening adversary. Now, let's walk through the steps in the stateful free talk model. The parties talk freely, the adversary receives the transcript and chooses the inputs for Alice and Bob. The parties get the inputs and send to the referee a single message each. The referee outputs a decision. How secret key agreement implies optimal equality protocol? The secret key agreement protocol can be used in the free talk phase, hence the secret state of the participants will be the secret key. After receiving their inputs, the participant will use the secret key to sample a pairwise independent hash function. The inputs will be compressed by that function to messages and sent to the referee. The referee just compares the messages. Note that this protocol is resilient to the mentioned patient rushing adversary. In the other direction, towards constructing secret key agreement, we first achieve the weaker notion of secret bit agreement. That is, parties agree on a bit with some probability, and that bit is secret in some weaker notion. Note that the notion of alpha beta secret bit agreement is a generalization of secret key agreement. And it is known when and how alpha beta secret bit agreement can be amplified to a secret key agreement. Hence, it is sufficient to show a construction of alpha beta secret bit agreement with suitable parameters. 
Now, assume we have such a near optimal protocol for equality. That means we have a way to generate secret state for Alice and Bob. We have functions from input and secret states to messages, and we have the function of the referee from messages to a bit. Our secret bit agreement protocol will be as follows. First, the secret state is generated, and Ali sampled a secret bit B in two uniformly random inputs x0, x1. Alice evaluates in the equality protocol a message for xb. She sends Bob this message in x1. Bob evaluates its message for x1, and his output b prime is the output of the equality referee on its own generated message and the received message. Alice's output is her sampled bit b. The agreement parameter of this protocol, that is the probability that b is equal to b prime, is given by the equality protocol. For showing the secrecy, we show that given an adversary who can predict that bit, we can construct an adversary for the equality protocol. Given a secret bit agreement adversary, the equality adversary will be as follows. In each session, he sets a random input x for Alice and waits for her message. Now, he samples another random input x prime and uses the secret bit agreement adversary to check if that random input also matches that message. That is, the adversary wants to find two inputs that can make Alice produce the same message with some probability. If he finds such inputs, he attacks that session by passing Bob X with probability half or X prime with probability half. The intuition is that if the adversary finds two messages X and X prime that make Alice behave similarly, the referee is going to be wrong on at least one pair, X and X or X and X prime. To conclude, such a secret bit agreement adversary contradicts the properties of the equality protocol. Hence, the secrecy property of the secret bit agreement protocol holds, and the secret bit agreement protocol can be amplified to a secret key agreement protocol. Before we finish, let's mention some related work. First, the consecutive messages model. In this model, the public random string is chosen after the adversary chooses the first input. Hence, a one-way function is necessary and sufficient to break the square root of n lower bound. The lower bound is shown via distributional one-way function that is known to be existentially equivalent to one-way function, unlike the case with DCRH and CRH. In the adversarial sketch model, there are two phases. The sketch phase, where each party receives its input online without any interaction with the other party, and the interaction phase, where there are no inputs, only sketches, and the parties communicate in order to compute the target function. They showed a lower bound for the sketch size that is very similar to the square root of n in the simultaneous messages model. In the property preserving hash functions model, the target predicate also should be computed from sketches. Different levels of robustness are defined. The more access to the hash function given to the adversary, the more robust the property preserving hash is. The full access robust property preserving hash functions might be seen as very close to our preset randomness model simultaneous messages. But here the error should be negligible and the parties are deterministic. For further research, it will be interesting to figure out in the preset randomness model whether CRHs are equivalent to protocols that break dimension bounds or to break those bounds with weaker primitives. In the free talk model, we would like to know whether protocols that are secure in weaker notions also imply secret key agreement. Let's thank the speaker. And I believe the speaker is here with us in the Zoom room if there are any questions.
Is that correct? Is he still here? Yes, yes. All right, I have a question. Um, so you listed quite a few different further research questions there at the end. Can you talk a bit more about whichever of those you think is the most uh, compelling? I think the the gap between uh, the CRH and the CRHs, uh, uh, because it's not clear if it's a uh, uh, technical uh, barrier or uh, or something more uh, significant. Oh, sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding your audio. Can you say that one more time? Can you hear me? Yeah, it's just a little muddled, but um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's good now. So, uh, okay. yeah, just please repeat. Okay, I think the gap between CRHs and the DCRHs uh, is the most compelling. Yeah, sorry, I'm just, I can hear you volume-wise fine, but the um, the words are coming out a little muddled. <laughs> so, I'm, so I'm not quite sure. At least the, the talk was uh, uh, pre-recorded. Yes. <laughs> are, there, are there any questions in Zoom? You can put them in the chat or any further questions in the room? Oh, all right. Well, I think everyone is anxious to get to lunch, so we will go ahead and do that. Uh, quick announcement, if you're interested in arranging a ride share uh, back tomorrow, they've started a chat channel for that, so that's um, accessible from the link on the main program. And we'll start sessions back up today at 1.50. Thank you. Sorry? <laughs>